To the Frontier from Commando of Horses and Men by Denise Reitz Our officer, or field cornet as he was called, was Mr. Zederberg, a coach contractor, and the rank and file were mostly young fellows from the civil service and the legal officers and shops in the town. Few of them had ever seen war or undergone military training, but they were full of ardour and in spite of cramped quarters and rough fare, we were like schoolboys as we clanked along. After a monotonous journey of three days, often broken by interminable halts, we reached Sandspreit, a small station about ten miles from the Natal border where we detrained. There were great numbers of burghers from the country districts already encamped on the plain, on either side of the railway line, and the felt on all sides was dotted with tents and wagon lagers. On the left of the track stood a large marquee over which floated the Fierklier flag of the Transvaal, indicating General Hubert's headquarters. Both he and his wife were thus early on the scene, it being her invariable custom to accompany her husband in the field. When we had detrained our horses and helped to ground the guns, we moved away to where a halting ground was assigned us. We off-saddled in the tall grass and, after building fires and preparing supper, we spent our first night in the open. For the next ten days we lay there enjoying the novelty of our surroundings, as if we were on a pleasure joint rather than seriously awaiting the coming of war. One evening my brother and I received a pleasant surprise, for there arrived in camp an old servant of ours, grinning from ear to ear at having found us. His name was Charlie, the grandson of the famous Basutu chief Moshesh. He had been a family retainer ever since I can remember, first in the Free State and then in the Transvaal, whither he had followed us. Latterly he had been on a visit to Umbandini, king of the Swazis, but, learning that there was to be a war, he returned at once to Pretoria, and my father sent him on to us. He was more than welcome, for we could now turn over to him our cooking and the care of the horses duties which we had been performing ourselves up till then. Moreover, he had brought me a splendid roan, which my father had sent me, as he feared that the Basutu pony would not be up to my weight. Every morning my brother and I had our horses fetched from the grazing ground, and we rode out to visit neighbouring camps and lagers, eager to see all that we could. We saw the stream of fresh contingents arriving daily by rail or riding in from the adjacent countryside, and watched with never-ending interest the long columns of shaggy men on shaggy horses passing by. At the end of the week there must have been nearly 15,000 horsemen collected there, ready to invade Natal, and we told ourselves that nothing could stop us from reaching the sea. Our military organization was a rough one. Each commando was divided into two or more felt cornices, and these again were subdivided into corporalships. A field cornice was supposed to contain 150 to 200 men, and a corporal ship nominally consisted of 25. But there was no fixed rule about this, and a popular field cornet or corporal might have twice as many men as an unpopular one, 
for a burger could elect which officer he wished to serve under, and could even choose his own commando, although generally he belonged to one representing the town or district from which he came. In the Pretoria commando, we divided ourselves into corporal ships by a kind of selective process, friends from the same government department or from the same part of town pooling their resources in the way of cooking utensils, etc., and in this manner creating separate little groups that in the course of time came to be recognized as military units. One of the number would be elected corporal to act as the channel through which orders were transmitted from above, and much the same system held in all other commandos. The commissariat arrangements were equally simple. Our field cornet would know the approximate number of men under his command, and in order to maintain supplies, all he needed to do was send a party to the food depot stacked beside the railway line, where they would break out as many bags of meal, sugar and coffee as they considered necessary, load them on a wagon, and dump them in the middle of the camp for each corporal ship to satisfy its requirements. The meat supply consisted of an immense herd of cattle on the hoof, from which every commando drew as many animals as it wanted for slaughter purposes. This system, though somewhat wasteful, worked fairly well the men were plainly but adequately fed on much the same diet as they were accustomed to at home, and there was little grumbling. Officers and men had to supply their own horses, rifles, clothing and equipment, and nobody received any pay. Ever since the Jamison raid, the Transvaal government had been importing large quantities of Mauser rifles from Germany which was sold to the burghers at a nominal figure, and as great stores of ammunition had likewise been accumulated, the commandos were very efficiently equipped. The two republics had mobilized between 60,000 and 70,000 horsemen, at this moment distributed west and east, ready to invade the Cape Colony and Natal at the given word. This great force, armed with modern weapons, was a formidable fighting machine which, had it been better led, might have made far other history than it did. How many troops the British had in South Africa, I do not know, but they were pouring reinforcements into the country, and I think our leaders underestimated the magnitude of the task on which they were embarked. So far as our information went in regard to Natal, the nearest British troops lay at the town of Dundee, some 50 miles away. This force we subsequently found to be about 7,000 strong, and still farther south at Ladysmith they had another 6,000 or 7,000 men, but with fresh troops being landed every day, it was difficult to say how soon the scales would dip against us. On the 10th of October, a great parade was held in honour of President Paul Kruger's birthday. We mustered what was then probably the largest body of mounted men ever seen in South Africa. It was magnificent to see commando after commando file past the Commandant General, each man brandishing hat or rifle according to his individual idea of a military salute. After the march passed, we formed in a mass and galloped cheering up the slope, where Pichubar sat on his horse beneath an embroidered banner. When we came to a halt, he addressed us from the saddle. I was jammed among the horsemen, so could not get close enough to hear what he was saying 
But soon word was passed that an ultimatum, written and signed by my father, had been sent to the British, giving them 24 hours in which to withdraw their troops from the borders of the Republic, failing which there was to be war. The excitement that followed was immense. The great throng stood in its stirrups and shouted itself hoarse, and it was not until long after the Commandant General and his retinue had fought their way through the crowd that the commandos began to disperse. The jubilation continued far into the night, and, as we sat around our fires discussing the coming struggle, we heard singing and shouting from the neighbouring camps until cockcrow. Next day, England accepted the challenge, and the war began. Once more, the excitement was unbounded. Fiery speeches were made, and General Dubert was received with tumultuous cheering as he rode through to address the men. Orders were issued for all commandos to be in readiness, and five days' rations of biltong and meal were issued. Flying columns were to invade Natal, and all transport was to be left behind. So my brother and I were obliged to send Charlie to the central lager, where the wagons were being parked until they could follow later. My brother and I had joined hands with some friends from our Pretoria suburb of Sunnyside, and after a few days we had become merged in a large body of which five brothers named Malerba were the leading spirits. We chose Isak Malerba, the eldest of them, to be our corporal, and a better man I never met. We soon came to be known as Isak Malerba's corporalship. He was about 35 years old, dark-complexioned, silent and moody, but we looked up to him because of the confidence which he inspired. His brothers were brave men too, but he stood head and shoulders above us all. After his death on the Tugela, we found that he was a man of considerable means, whose wife and two small daughters were left well provided for. War was officially declared on the 11th of October. At dawn on the following morning, the assembled commandos moved off, and we started on our first march. As far as the eye could see, the plain was alive with horsemen, guns and cattle, all steadily going forward to the frontier. The scene was a stirring one and I shall never forget riding to war with that great host. It has all ended in disaster, and I am writing this in a strange country, but the memory of those first days will ever remain.